Ecclesiastes 3. If you're new to your Bible, it's right toward the middle. So open up to the book of Psalms in the middle and go one to the right. That's Proverbs. Go one more to the right. That's Ecclesiastes. And we're going to be in verses 1 to 15 this morning. Uh, Quick review as you're turning there. Ecclesiastes is written by King Solomon, the one that the Bible says is the wisest man who ever lived apart from Jesus Christ. And, And he's writing this book to tell us how life goes under the sun. He's writing to communicate to us what we should actually expect out of life on this side of heaven. So that's what we're going to see in our passage today. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 15. Um, If you will read it with me, and let me just remind us, number one, God, I ask for your help and your power to speak uh, with your spirit, and I ask that you would give us ears to hear. Um, This is the word of God. And the only way that we can understand this book is if God allows us to understand this book. And so we, we need help to spiritually discern what he says. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 15. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what's planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather together stones time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He's made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he's put eternity into man's heart. Yet, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Well, I'm I'm guessing that most of you guys have at least some familiarity with this passage. I know that Ecclesiastes is not the book that I log most of my hours in, but I have heard the song Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds from 1965, and they just stole the first eight verses of this song, or this this passage to create their song. And I thought, you know what, William, if you were like a good, catchy preacher, you would come up with some way to build your intro around that. But then I thought, nah, my man Jason's just been slaying the song lyrics. (laughs) The first two weeks of this, of this series. I'm going to go a different route with my intro. Uh, have you ever played the game of life, the board game? Um, here's how the directions for the game of life go. Travel the path of life making decisions, building a family, earning money, buying homes and collecting life tiles. Have the highest value at the end of the game and win. That's how the game goes. You make a few decisions about what kind of education you're going to get and what kind of family you're going to have and how life's going to go. And whoever gets to retirement first with the most money, that's the big winner. Now, this can be a great way to spend a Friday night with your family. But I'll tell you what's not great. It's not great when we expect real life to go the way the game goes. 
it, it's not great when we think if I can just kind of map out what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go to school and who I'm going to fall in love with, and then the great adventures that we're going to go on until we settle into our dream job and buy our forever home and we raise our perfect family with the hypoallergenic doodle of our choice, <laughs> right? Or, or whatever your vision of the good life is. But see, we, we know that there's, there's more to life than this under the sun. And, and if we don't understand that, when life doesn't go the way that we plan or pray or hope, we're going to be vulnerable to all kinds of disillusionment and discouragement and depression. But if we know what to expect out of life, if we know how life actually goes, we've got a far better chance of navigating it with wisdom and joy. I think that's one of the reasons God put this passage in the Bible. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 15, God lays out his expectations for how life goes under the sun. And I'm just going to be straight up with you. It's not necessarily what we want to hear. But it's what we need to hear. God tells us what to expect as we walk through life. He, he answers this question. How does it really go? W what is life really like? That's what we're going to see in our text today. And if I had to give you a main idea, if I had to summarize what you're going to see here, I'd say it this way. God sovereignly orders the seasons of our lives for our good, so live like it. God sovereignly orders every season of our life for our good, so live like it. And here's how we're going to break this down. You know, I don't have some good little structure. Here's what I got for you. I got four reality checks. And I got two responses to those realities. That's what we're going to see in this passage. Four reality checks. This is how life actually goes. And then two responses to those realities. Reality check number one. Life is made up of diverse seasons. Life is made up of diverse seasons. We see this in verse one. Solomon writes, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Now, when he says seasons, he's not talking like winter, spring, summer, fall. That gives you a new excuse to buy a cute outfit, okay, which my girls like to do that, okay? And he's not talking about hunting season. He's not talking about sports, like football season, and then basketball season, and then bowl season, and then March Madness, and then some golf majors, and then you got to suffer through those few weeks of Little League season when there's nothing else on. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? He's, ta he's talking about seasons of life. The word, the word season here means a set time, an appointed time. Life under the sun is made up of set times and appointed seasons, stages that we go through, uh, occasions that we face for every matter, roads that we must walk down, seasons of life that we endure. That they are appointed means we typically don't have any more control over them than when the snow falls or when the leaves turn or the day that we are born or the day that we die. For, for the most part, we don't control the seasons of our lives. And this is how all of life goes. It's true, notice, for everything, for every matter. Now, Solomon illustrates this principle with a poem of verses 2 through 8. And he prophetically looks into the future and he quotes a band called The Birds from 1965. <laughs> and, and notice the first lyric. There is a time to be born and a time to die. Why does he start there? Well, he's saying that this is how all of life goes from the beginning to the end. From the start to the finish, life is made up of one appointed season after another. Okay, and the structure of the poem communicates the same idea. Seven verses, 14 couplets, 28 mentions of time. All multiples of seven, the biblical number of completion or perfection. Here's what Solomon's saying. From start to finish, from the beginning of your life to the end, Here's what we should expect from life under the sun. It's made up of one season after another. 
And in those seven verses, in those 14 couplets, here's what you got. You got 14 equal opposites. What's the deal with that? He's showing us that the seasons that we face are diverse. All manner of seasons are going to come our way. And there's a time for every single one of them. This is true on a macro level, and it's true on a micro level, okay? Um, some seasons we'll all face together, right? Look at, look at verse 8. There's a time for war and a time for peace. So think 9-11, concerns over the state of the world, an election year, COVID. We, we all go through some of these things together. Whole communities, whole nations, whole generations might go through certain things together. But did you notice as you look at the list that the vast majority of these times and seasons, they focus on us as individuals. That's where Solomon puts his emphasis. It's not just that all of history is made up of one appointed season after another. It's that our lives, your life, is made up of one diverse season after another. This is how life goes under the sun. Now, here's some good news. Fourteen of these seasons are relatively pleasant. Some of the seasons that the Lord takes us through are going to be wonderful. They're going to be good. Now, with, with Hebrew poetry, just like it is with English poetry, not all of these things are meant to be taken literally. Some, some of them are. Others are metaphors for the, the good things we go through. But here's what's clear. As we go through life, some of what God gives us, it will be really enjoyable. There is a time to be born, right? Time for new life. There, there are times for planting and gathering and building up. There are times for laughing and dancing and embracing. There are times for seeking and keeping, times for loving and healing. As we go through life, we should expect some pleasant seasons under the sun. Praise God. There's going to be some good times. There's going to be snow days. And there's going to be school canceled. There's going to be summers that you don't ever want to end. There's going to be seasons of sweet friendship that is rich. There's going to be times to fall in love, to plan a wedding. That, that may not be a pleasant season. There's going to be times for weddings and receptions, for honeymoon phases, for new jobs, right? For chuckling at your little kids and how funny they are. There, there are wonderful seasons where you watch them grow up and play sports and perform. There's laughter around the dinner table. There's times where business is booming. There's time to be a new grandparent and to spoil the people on earth that you love most. There are good times under the sun. Those are coming our way. But did you notice that in each of these 14 couplets, in each of these pleasant times, there's an equal and opposite painful time. There's an equal and opposite difficult time. There are times for things to be plucked up and broken down, even killed. There are times for things to be torn and cast away and lost. There are times to be silent and to refrain from embracing. There are times to weep and to mourn. There is a time to die. These are the kinds of seasons that we come up against under the sun. The Bible is telling us what to expect. It is preparing us for reality. See, life under the sun sometimes comes with bad news, with broken relationships with betrayal, with plans that change, with dreams that die. It comes with wandering children, parents who let you down, terrible phone calls, terminal illness, tragedy, suffering, heartbreak, losing the ones you love most, death, 
Game of Life does not tell you this. But this is how life goes under the sun. It's made up of one diverse season after another, mostly out of our control. Some are pleasant. Some are painful. This is how life goes. It's how it actually goes. And the news gets even more sober before it gets better. For reality check number two, we move from the poetry of verses 2 through 8 to the prose of verse 9. And here, here's our next reality check. On this side of heaven, we're not going to arrive. On this side of heaven, we're not going to arrive. Now, I don't know if you're like me in Victoria, but if you are, actually, we had a grammatical discussion this morning. I think I might have said that wrong. I don't know if you're like Victoria and me, okay? But the vast majority of our conflicts come from mismanaged expectations. Anybody relate to that? We, we think we're going to get one thing. We expect one thing. We're ready for one thing. And then something else comes, and one of us ends up sad or mad or frustrated because we feel like we're blindsided. That, that's where most of our conflict comes. And in verses 9 and verse 11, Solomon protects us from that happening to us in real life. He, he manages our expectations. He shoots us straight. And notice what he says in verse 9. He asks this rhetorical question, what gain has the worker from his toil? You remember that word gain? We've seen it in both of the last two weeks. It means, means profit. It's a monetary term. But, but Solomon uses it to encompass more than that. Right? He, he uses it, he talks about gain as an attempt to achieve lasting benefit. To find lasting meaning and security and satisfaction in the things of the earth. To arrive. Here's what he's saying here. He's saying, you really think you're going to find what you're looking for in one of life's seasons? Do you really think you're going to arrive? You you think in one of the seasons that God gives you and the work that he's given you to do in that season that all of a sudden you're going to find that security and that meaning and that satisfaction that you crave? You think you're going to find gain? From your toil, you're going to accomplish something in the end that matters where you can ride off into the sunset? No, no, no. He's saying, hey, reality check. On this side of heaven, you're not going to arrive. You're just not. And I especially want to speak to the young people here. If you're a young person, I need your eyes, okay? I don't care how little you are. Let me talk to you. When you hear this, if you were like me when I was young, you know what this sounded like to me? Sounded like bad news, right? I I wanted to grow up and accomplish my dreams and change the world, and I thought I could. That's what the basketball coaches told me when I was little. (laughs) And, And listen, your youth, your idealism, your willingness to risk and try things, it's a gift, and it's gonna lead you on adventures that your parents are too scared to take. That's awesome. But here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to buy the lie that accomplishing something or or finding some perfect relationship with the boy of your dreams, right, or or building some family or settling some life or some season, right, it is going to bring you gain. You're not going to reach some season of happily ever after under the sun, And if you're not aware of this, if you're not aware that this is how life goes, you're not going to arrive, here's here's what you're in danger of. You're in danger of discouragement and becoming jaded and disillusionment and deconstruction like so many others in your generation. You need to know how life actually goes. You're not going to arrive. An older person, as much as this is a, you know, discouraging news to the young person, let this be an encouragement to you. If you got nagging feelings of failure because you hadn't accomplished what you hoped you would have accomplished, If you feel just shame or frustration or anger because you hadn't reached that season that you craved, that you longed for, that you hoped you would get to, guess what? Good news. That's not where gain is found. We don't get gain from toil. 
And, and, and all the people who have accomplished those things that you want to accomplish or they have reached that perfect season that you wanted to reach, you know what they're learning right now? They're learning this lesson by experience. There's no lasting gain from that season. It's a mirage. Hey, and even if there was, you know what would come right behind it? Just another season. That's how life really goes under the sun. Solomon's making eye contact and he's saying to us, let me help you with your expectations. Let me give you a reality check that will not go viral on Instagram. On this side of heaven, you're not going to arrive. Okay, this leads us to our third reality check, and hopefully it's the last one that tastes like bad medicine, all right? Number three, on this side of heaven, we won't always understand. On this side of heaven, reality check, you're not always going to understand. Look with me at the, the second half of verse 11. It tells us that God has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Okay, that God has put eternity in man's heart means this. We know that we're part of something bigger. We know that there is an almighty eternal God. We know that there are cosmic realities. We know that he is accomplishing eternal purposes. And with eternity set in our heart, we want to know what those are. We have a desire to understand. We want to know how all the pieces fit together. And we especially want to know how all the pieces of our lives fit together. And yet, as finite sinful creatures in a fallen world, this tells us that we have very limited access to understanding the big picture. That's what Solomon means when he says we cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. As we go through the ups and downs of life, as you walk through the seasons of life, friend, there are going to be things that, that you do not understand. Just as we saw in the first eight verses, there are going to be things that we don't control. They're uncontrollable. Here we see that some things in our life will be incomprehensible. We will not understand them. Lord, how did you let this happen? Lord, I don't like this hand that I've been dealt. Why is it like this? God, what are you doing in this situation? You got any of those? I, I'm just confused. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Can you relate to that? That's how life goes under the sun. But listen, how kind of God to let us know how kind of God to let us know that we won't always understand, right? If we know that there are going to be some times that we don't always understand, we're far more likely to, to endure through those incomprehensible seasons. And, and friends, I wish I'd have learned this lesson earlier. I wish I would have known this. Uh, before we moved to Franklin six years ago, we lived in Savannah, Georgia, and I pastored at a church there that we loved. And we lived in a house that we loved. And, and we had dreams for our future, and we thought we knew the way that it, it was going to go. And I, I wouldn't have said it this way, but looking back, in some ways, I thought we had arrived. And then it was like a tornado came into our elder team, and there was a total split filled with sin and bitterness and chaos and confusion and anger and slander. And it was the most painful thing, one of the most painful things I've ever walked through in my life. And I didn't have a category for it. And so I went immediately to question asking. Lord, what are you doing? Why is that happening? How could this person do this? Why isn't that person standing up? Why are you allowing this? What's going on? And there were very few answers. And because I hadn't yet learned that sometimes we just won't understand, my suffering went deeper and it lasted longer than it probably needed to. Friend, on this side of heaven, our understanding is going to be limited. 
we will not be able to figure everything out. And aren't you glad to know that? You know what that means? We can stop trying to figure it out. We can let our soul rest. Right? And you might hear that and you might say, hey, man, easy for you to say. You, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know about the season that I'm in. How can you tell my soul to rest right now? Well, hey, I'm not telling you, but I'm going to let this next reality check unlock that key. Because there's a reason your soul can rest. A biblical reason your soul can rest. Now, if you're here and you're thinking, man, this is depressing. Uh, honey, I don't want to come back next week. Here's what you need to know. I'm just a member. I do this maybe once a year, okay? <laughs> so you'll get a new guy next week. Second, here's what you need to know. Everything we've said so far, anybody, Christian or non-Christian, with a little bit of wisdom could have said. Life is made up of diverse seasons. You don't control them. Some are pleasant. Some are painful. You're not going to arrive. It's not always going to make sense. Anybody can say that. Okay, but here's where this becomes a Christian message. This is where this becomes Christian preaching. There's good news for you no matter what season you're in. Okay? And we see this good news in verses 10 and 11a. Solomon writes, I haven't even told you what the, the reality check is. Here's the reality check. God is at work in every season of your life for your good. That's reality check number four. God is at work in every season of your life for your good. Okay, verse 10 and 11a. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Now, there are a couple things we need to make sure we see here. First things first. Big E on the eye chart. God is behind it all. See that in verse 10? Behind every season, there is God. Allowing and assigning each one of our seasons. The business of our lives that we find ourselves busy with, God has given it. There is a sovereign hand that has appointed it. Okay? Friend, this is very, very, very good news. This is great news, okay? But it will only be good news to you to the degree that you understand who God is and you understand what he's up to. This will, this will only be good news to you if you know a little something about his character and you know a little something about his purposes. Here's what I mean by that. That God is behind every season of your life might not encourage you if you doubt the goodness of God, especially when you walk through a tough season. And, and if you have no clue what God's doing in those tough seasons, if you have no idea about his purposes, then you're probably going to try to get out of the bad ones as quick as you can and prolong the good ones for as long as you can. But when we know his character and when we know his purposes, it changes everything. So, so let's just review his character for a minute. What, what's the best judge of someone's character? Their actions, right? Best judge of someone's character is their actions. So let's just review some of God's actions. Well, there was a time for creation and a time for the flood. There was a time for an exodus and a time for a law. There was a time for priests and there was a time for sacrifices. There was a time for judges and there was a time for kings. There was a time for prophets and there was a time for prophecies. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And at just the right time, when we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. All through his life, he, he had this phrase, the time has not yet come. The time has not yet come. The time has not yet come. Until the night before he died, you know what he said? The hour is at hand. The time is here. And on a divine timeline, Passover weekend, 33 AD, there was a time for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be silent. 
a time to be broken down and cast away and torn. There was a time for war to be declared on him from heaven. There was a time to kill. There was a time for his followers to weep and mourn and refrain from embracing. Was there ever a season in the life of anybody that seemed more difficult to understand than that season in the life of his disciples? The Son of God defeated, dead, But God was at work in that season, wasn't he? We know what was happening in that season, don't we? He was bruised for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we're healed. And then you know what time it was on the third day? It was time to rise. And then it was time to laugh and dance and rejoice. And then times of refreshing came from the presence of the Lord. That's the God who's behind every season in your life. That's his character. Right? You might not know what the season of your life means, but to paraphrase one pastor, here, you know what it doesn't mean. The cross shows you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It doesn't mean he's not good. It doesn't mean he's out of control. Doesn't mean he's forgotten you. Oh, it's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who is behind every season. And friend, he is up to good purposes, really good purposes. Look at 11a. He has made everything beautiful in its time. What does that mean? Okay, it means that in every season that we face, every win, every loss, every high, every low, every challenge, every success, every sleepless night, every month that we're gripped by fear, in the best times and in the worst times, God is using them all to make something beautiful out of me and you. Hey, and and look at this, this is cool. It's in the past tense. It's as good as done, right? Now, I love the, the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm thankful for it. It is, it is straight shooting. I'm, I'm thankful it's not all the scripture that we have. Very thankful, okay? And, and the New Testament translation of Ecclesiastes 311a is Romans 8, 28, and 29. You want to know what beauty God is up to in your life? You want to know what kind of beauty he's making you into? Listen to these verses. You know them. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Everything we go through, every single season, it's working for some good, for some beauty. Well, what's that beauty? Well, what's verse 29 say? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What's the idea? Every single season that we face, together or separate, pleasant or painful, uncontrollable or incomprehensible, every single season that we face is a sign by God for this purpose, that we would be conformed into the image of his son. Every single thing that comes your way. That you would know him more and that you would be made more like him. That you would know, not just in theory, but in experience, closeness to Christ and conformity to Christ. Friend, listen to me. Is there anything better than that? Is there anything better than that? Do you know that's what you need most? More than anything else in the whole world. And and Christian, if you have the Spirit of God in you, if you have the life of God in you, is there anything you want more than that? Deep down, deepest level of your being, to know Christ, to be made more like him. He is up to that in every single season of your life. 
It's his good purpose behind everything that comes our way. He's making everything beautiful in its time. He's making us like Jesus. So those are our reality checks. That's, that's what we can expect under the sun. God sovereignly orders the seasons of our lives for our good. He's doing a beautiful work in every season. Okay, that's reality. Our job now is to live like it. Our job now is to live like it. So how do we do that? I want to give you two responses. Uh, one in verses 12 and 13. One in verses 14 and 15. Uh, first, verses 12 and 13. Solomon writes, I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Okay, so Solomon gives us his, his first application of these realities with his phrase, I perceived. It's how he, he structures his application. You're going to see that again in verse 14. So in light of these uncontrollable, incomprehensible seasons, what did he perceive? What are we supposed to do as we go through life with all its various seasons and occasions? Well, best thing to do, he says, be joyful, do good, find a little pleasure in your food and your drink and your work. And here's why. It's God's gift to you. That's God's gift to man. He, here's, how I would, uh, here's how I would summarize it for the sake of a sermon. Here's our res- response. I would say embrace and enjoy the season that you're in. Response number one. How do, we, how do we live in light of these realities in a God-glorifying way? Well, we embrace and enjoy the season that we're in. So, friend, are you in a pleasant season right now? Are, are there sweet relationships? Or maybe you're enjoying work or your marriage or your activities or your family. Are you in a pleasant season right now? What do you do? Will you enjoy it. You, you drink it in. You celebrate it. You, you soak it up. You raise your glass. You make a toast. You trace the gift back to the giver. And, and you thank him for the sweetness of relationships. And you thank him for the abundance of provision. You, you praise God from whom all blessings flow. And you smile. And you enjoy. That's what obedience looks like for you. And isn't it amazing? I just, one of the things that struck me most this week, in a sin-cursed world that is awaiting judgment, that's what we live in, right? Everybody knows that. That's our reality, life under the sun. In a sin-cursed world that is awaiting judgment, how amazing that gift after gift after gift after gift comes your way. Enjoy them. Just enjoy them. And trace the gifts back to the giver and enjoy him, okay? Well, what about if I'm in a painful season, you ask? What's my application? You got the same application. Embrace and enjoy the season that you're in. Okay, first, embrace it. Don't diminish it. Don't waste it. Don't take matters into your own hands. And find enjoyment in it. Now, no doubt, I'm not naive, your enjoyment is going to be different than the person in a pleasant season. But, but it's possible, and it's even commanded. Be joyful always. Count it all joy when you face trials of many, many kinds. How do I do that? Well, let me give you a couple ways. You ever noticed how in the most intense trials and through the most severe suffering, it's usually then that we see how precious those little gifts are that we take for granted all the time. Like a text from your friend or hearing your dad's voice on the phone. 
or sitting with your family around the table or holding your wife's hand and being understood or laughter. If you're going through a really difficult season, there are little gifts everywhere for you if you'll have eyes to see them. But there's also a bigger gift. And the bigger gift is this. It's usually in the toughest times, in the worst times, in the most painful times, that God gives us more and more of himself. He deepens our relationship with him. He expedites our sanctification, and we get God. And when we get on the other side of it, no, we don't want to go back to that season, but you know what else we don't want to do? We don't want to trade it. It wasn't pleasant, but it's good. And because it's good, you can embrace it and even enjoy it. That, that's response number one. Here's response number two. Worship God. How do we respond to all this? Well, we stand in awe of God. Let me show you where I get that. Verses 14 and 15. Solomon says, I perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Here's the big idea. Everything that God does endures. His work cannot be stopped. His plans cannot be thwarted. Everything God does endures. Now that is true on a global, cosmic, historic level. And there have been volumes written about that. You, you know what, uh, where else that's true? On a personal level. In every single season of your life. I want you just to think for a minute about some of the seasons that you've been through. And I want you to think about how God showed up in some of those seasons. Friend, be encouraged by this. Every prayer that God empowered you to ever pray, all the endurance that he enabled you to endure with, all the grace-empowered generosity in tight seasons, all the worship in the car that nobody else saw. All the sacrificial service for a difficult child or an aging parent. All, all the grace-empowered service of the church. Any good work that God ever started at any stage in your life, at any season, any bit of faithfulness you were able to exert with his help. You know what this is telling us? Oh, it will all endure. Every tear that you cried is bottled up by God, Psalm 56. Every prayer you've ever prayed is before him like incense. He has seen it all. He sees you, friend. And, and look at that last verse, that last phrase. He seeks what has been driven away. None of it will be lost. So what do you do? Well, you fear before him. You worship him. That's the New Test Testament translation. You praise the glory of his grace. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. He will bring to light the things hidden in darknesses, darkness. He will disclose the purposes of the heart. And then each one will receive his commendation from God. All the work of God that he's done in your life, in every season of your life, nothing will be taken away from it. Nothing will be lost. And when you look back, friend, I don't know what you're going through, and I'm sure it's far more intense than what I've endured in my life. I know this about our God. It will all have been worth it. It will all have been worth it. Friends, this passage is not a game. It's reality. It tells us how life actually goes under the sun. It's made up of diverse seasons that for the most part are out of our control. Some of them are pleasant, praise God. 
Some of them are painful. Don't expect to arrive. Don't expect to understand. But here's what you can bank on. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God who gave us his Son and his Spirit. He's at work in every single season for our good. He is making everything beautiful in its time. So let's live like it. Let's pray.